Okay, so this is chapter three, and we're going to be talking about inflammation and the inflammatory response. We're going to talk a little bit about fever as well. So first of all, when we talk about inflammation, um, we've all heard of inflammation. Oh, that's inflamed, or you're having an inflammatory response or whatever. Um, it's, it's an innate automatic response to cell injury. So cell injury could be just about anything. You could scratch your arm, and you would trigger this inflammatory response uh, at least at least part of it um, and so we're going to go through we're going to go through all the parts of inflammation uh, in as much detail as we can uh, so the purpose of inflammation in general is to neutralize harmful agents so like bacteria things like that so something that has moved in and uh, so we want to have a localized response, first of all, that tries to get rid of that on the spot and then, uh, and then just sort of do, a de do away with it. Uh, removes damaged and dead tissue. Um, so that can take place, uh, anything else that's foreign in there. Uh, generates new tissue. So we need to generate new tissue and promote healing. Okay, so that's the other thing that the inflammatory response initiates. Uh, minimizes the effect of the injury or the infection. Okay, so uh, it's not something that we want to have occur all the time. We don't want chronic inflammation or something like that. But for acute phase, it's it's necessary. Okay, so so when you when you get uh, poked by something, you get a thorn or something like that, uh, it's necessary for your body to have some kind of a reaction because something has probably gotten in there, some kind of bacteria or something like that, uh, and some kind of tissue damage has taken place. Okay, so in general, damaged cells release inflammatory mediators. Okay, so we're going we're gonna to define these as uh, cytokines uh, for the most part, but also things like histamine, uh, uh, prostaglandins, those types of things can also be uh, triggered. So we're gonna we're gonna talk about those. Um, <clears throat> your book divides the local response into a vascular stage and a cellular stage. So we're going to we're going to do, go through those in that order, and that's and that's absolutely fine. And then we'll talk about the systemic. So this is a local response. So we want so you know if you if you hurt your finger, you want to keep it local to begin with. This is a hand, by the way. Uh, hello. So you want to keep it local to begin with, and then uh, hopefully that can that can deal with the problem. However, if it becomes too bad, like you maybe get a serious infection or something like that, uh, then that can actually trigger a systemic response, and then your white blood cells will get involved, um, and your acute phase response of a systemic. Um, infection will take place and so we'll go over those two so first of all we need to without getting into all of immunology we do need to talk about the leukocytes or the white blood cells okay now your book like a lot of books divides these into two categories granulocytes and agranulocytes a means no so granulocytes have are cells with little granules in them and if you if you kind of move down here and you look at this you can see that these have granules okay and these granules contain various things that I have listed here okay so uh, we'll just go through these uh, first of all you 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 have to keep these straight and and it's really not that difficult uh, from what I want you to know about them so neutrophils are the first responders so you need to know that they're the first ones in you have neutrophils in your bloodstream all the time just sort of rolling through okay they're rolling through your through your blood vessels all the time and so anytime that there's an injury the neutrophils are usually going to be the first ones to to notice it okay uh, so they're usually the first responder they don't live very long it's uh, a matter of hours usually less than a day like 10 hours or something like that that the neutrophils will come in and they'll try to clear whatever they can and then they will die. They will go through apoptotic mechanisms and they will die. And so what they do is after a period of time, if you have enough neutrophils being pulled in there and they all die, they create something called pus. So when I think of neutrophils, I think of those two things, first responder and pus. Okay? They are also the most plentiful, okay? which kind of goes along with first responder because they're 
there are so many of them that it's really hard to have an injury without a neutrophil being there very, very quickly. All right, these other, so that's the first gran granulocyte. Um, they have granules, they have certain toxins to kill invaders. Um, that uh, that's one of the things that they do is they is they try to kill any bacteria or anything that that's come in. Um, the, they also produce produce some of these uh, signal molecules as well. So eosinophils, the reason the reason I brought that up is because these guys I have them. I don't know why I had to draw that because I already have brackets around them. But these guys are a lot of times associated with allergies and allergic diseases. So. In a sense, that means that they all really produce um, histamine, okay? Histamines, and they and they sometimes trigger prostaglandins and leukotrienes, okay, to be to be produced, which we'll talk about those too. So eosinophils, that's how you say that, eosinophil. Now, when I think of eosinophils, I think of worms, okay? Um, whoa, I think of worms. Eosinophils are, if you get a parasitic infection, a multicellular parasite, which usually we're talking about worms, then your eosinophil levels will go up. And if you look at the labs and you see that someone is sick and you don't know why, and then you see that their eosinophil levels are skyrocketing, well, there's a decent chance that you at least should look for a uh, parasitic worm infection. Okay, But they are also involved in the allergic response. So that means that they will also release histamine, and this histamine will, can cause other inflammatory processes um, and itching. Okay, so that's one of the things we know about. We think about when we think about histamine is we think that it's causing you know this itching kind of thing, uh, but that's not necessarily the only thing that it does because here's here are mast cells which also release histamine, and that's I when I think of mast cells I think of things like like sneezing kinds of allergies, uh, localized in tissue for allergic responses, but you know they're they're kind of scattered around your your mucous membranes, but they're also found in your intestines and things like in places like that, anywhere that you can easily get invaders in. So we have a lot of weak spots, any kinds of holes, our mouth, our nose, um, any any kind of any kind of entry point. Our whole digestive system goes all the way through us. Um, can is is a source of infection and so these mast cells just kind of hang out there they hang out in the tissue so think about what that means when i say in the tissue you have to understand that this is the blood cell here so we'll draw a couple of, or this is the the uh, a vessel we can say this is a capillary or an arterial or something like that but it's a blood vessel and blood is moving through there okay and outside there are is the extracellular fluid, and there might be some cells in there. Well, that's kind of where the mast cells hang out. Okay, so the mast cells will hang out in the tissue. So that's what I mean by that. It's not they're not circulating in the blood like the neutrophils were. Uh, they tend to hang out in the tissue. Of course, they have to get there through the blood, uh, but that's generally generally where they're found and where they do the most good. Okay, so when I think of mast cells, I usually think of allergies. Uh, histamine and uh, it's involved we know that it's involved in anaphylaxis basophils are very close to mast cells now we know that anaphylaxis is involved uh, or mast cells are involved in anaphylaxis anaphylaxis is just a uh, very severe immune response so you you may have heard of anaphylactic shock okay so so mast cells tend to uh, be the triggers of that uh, basophils are also found, but basophils tend to be in the bloodstream more. So they tend to maybe maybe hang out here in the capillaries more, and um, they're still they're still trying to learn a little bit more about basophils. Uh, we know that they are involved in amplification of the allergic response, but not necessarily anaphylaxis. How anaphylaxis? However, something like a bee sting, if you're allergic to bees. Well, basophils, well, they have the little antibodies put on them that happen to react to bee venom, certain proteins in bee venom. And so, so that's one of their, one of their jobs, okay? Uh, so these are the granulocytes. So neutrophils, first responder pus, eosinophils, worms, parasitic worms, mast cells, anaphylaxis, and uh, allergic responses. Basophils, also the allergic response with the ampli amplification. The difference between mast cells is mast cells are in tissue. Basophils are not necessarily in tissue, okay? They tend to be more in the blood.
Okay, so we're not going to get into what each one of these contains. You don't have to know them. That's why I kept this stuff separate. Uh, but depending on the cell, the granules contain a range of chemicals, including histamine. Okay, so you have histamine receptors. So the histamine is released, binds to histamine receptors, causes a local inflammatory response. Uh, heparin, which prevents clotting, they contain some of them contain toxins to kill invaders. Eosinophils, that's how they can they kill invaders. They have toxins that specifically uh, target parasitic worms, and they will destroy a parasitic worm just with the toxins that they contain in these in these little granules here. Okay. Um, Proteases, which break down proteins, enzymes to synthesize prostaglandins and leukotrienes, which we haven't talked about yet. And then uh, they all, all of them have cytokines and chemokines, which we'll also talk about. But these are pretty much just signal molecules. Okay, so we'll get into a little more detail on those later. Okay. So those were the granulocytes that have the little granules. And now we have the agranulocytes. And really there are... A few of these, but really two categories. Um, monocytes turn into macrophages. Okay, so here, if this is a blood vessel, here are the monocytes, and monocytes tend to be in the blood. Okay, so that's the monocyte, it's in the blood. Well, when there is a allergic response, or actually macrophages will just move out into the tissue. They're also uh, white blood cells that are just found kind of hanging out in the tissue. But when they are activated or when they move out into the tissue, they become activated and they are there to phagocytose or eat any kind of dead cells, bacteria, anything that they see as foreign. That's what the macrophages do. Okay, so how, how are these related? Inactive monocytes circulate until they receive a chemotaxic signal and then they move into the interstitial space as macrophages. So that's why this is written this way. Monocytes that are circulating turn into macrophages, and the macrophages are what exist out here in the tissue, and you'll find macrophages in the tissue. Now, when you have an inflammatory response or an injury, you'll find a lot of macrophages, okay, because they're, they're drawn to sites of cell damage and uh, inflammatory and they react to those inflammatory response and they continue that inflammatory response. Okay, so macrophages phagocytose eat and digest invaders rather than secreting toxins. They also produce signal molecules to prolong the immune response. Now all of these guys are producing signal signal molecules uh, to to bring in to signify or signal that there's been there's been some kind of damage. Okay. Uh, so that includes the agranulocytes as well. Lymphocytes, I know we've got words here because we're talking about leukocytes, which means leuco means white, or leuk means white, I don't know. Uh, but leukocytes means white blood cells. Lymphocytes has this keyword, and that's lymph. And those are typ typically found in the lymph tissue. Okay, so they now they can circulate too they have to get to the lymph tissue somehow but they tend to collect in the lymph tissue that's why they're called lymphocytes so we have t cells and b cells t lymphocytes and b lymphocytes t lymphocytes tend to focus more on killing infected or damaged cells now we're not getting into the difference between helper T cells and cytotoxic T cells. Cytotoxic T cells are the ones that will kill infected or damaged cells. Uh, helper T cells kind of uh, help the uh, immune response to progress. So, but in general, that's what, that's what we're concerned about for the uh, inflammatory response is that the T cells kill infected or damaged cells. B lymphocytes, however, those are the ones that create the little Y-shaped antibodies. And, uh, so B cells tend to have those antibodies on them, and these are antibody receptors, and then when they're activated, if there's some kind of a foreign molecule or something, then they will turn into a plasma cell. And whatever that receptor is, it obviously binds to that foreign pathogen, and so it will produce those and send them out into the blood. And that's what we think of as antibodies. So you can kind of see that picture here. So lymphocytes, you have T lymphocytes, T cells, B lymphocytes, B cells, and then an activated B cell is called a plasma cell. Okay, and you can see this little guy is producing antibodies.
Okay, so um, it's called a plasma cell when it's producing antibodies. Remember that. Okay, so B cells turn into plasma cells and those are the antibody producers. So lymphocytes communicate with each other. They communicate with other lymphocytes for a prolonged and targeted immune response. Now, usually you don't see activation of the T cells and B cells or the lymphocytes uh, until the infection has gone or the uh, inflammation has gone systemic. Okay, when it's still localized, generally the T cells and the B cells don't get involved. Maybe some cytotoxic T, cell, cytotoxic T cells might show up in there, uh, but in general, uh, they're not the ones that are that are really a big part of this uh, when it's local. All right, so normally, okay, so now we have to figure out exactly what this whole inflammation thing is. So normally when there's no inflammation or injury, your blood cells have these little endothelial cells. That's what these guys are here, okay, have these endothelial cells. And these endothelial cells produce a protective barrier okay so they're not they're keeping things in that are supposed to be in they're keeping things out that are supposed to be out and that's good unless it gets damaged okay and when it gets damaged things start to mix okay that's what triggers inflammation okay so the endothelial cells form a selective barrier that keeps most microbes out and controls what can move into and out of the vessels um, and that would be the vessel environment versus the interstitial environment this is the vessel environment this is the interstitial environment out here Okay, uh, endothelial cells lining the vessels produce agents that keep them open and unobstructed. So there's no, con or there is constriction and dilation. That that happens just as a normal part of day-to-day -day life. You sometimes constrict, you sometimes dilate. Depends on temperature, lots of things. Uh, so that's functioning normally, um, but they tend to be open and unobstructed. So that's that's important. And what we would say is they're non-thrombogenic, which means that they don't produce clots. So here are platelets, and platelets are involved in blood clotting, and yet in the blood vessel, when everything is working right, these little endothelial cells produce molecules that tell these platelets to not um, coagulate, to not stick together to form a clot. And so these, these platelets tend to just sort of flow, flow through there nicely. Uh, platelets are unable to bind to other platelets, so, cell, so clotting does not occur. Okay, so many cells and other chemical factors are circulating but do not cause inflammation. So let's look at some of these things here. here uh, here's a basophil. So we mentioned the basophil, and I said, well, basophils tend to be in the blood uh, while uh, mast cells tend to collect in the tissue, and that's exactly what we see here. We see the basophils that are in the blood, and then we see the mast cell that's out here in the tissue. Eosinophils tend to circulate. Uh, uh, lymphocytes tend to be in, in the lymph nodes, but they also move through the blood at times. Uh, neutrophils, rolling neutrophils are constantly, lots of those going through the blood. And then monocytes. Monocytes, remember, they're monocytes until they turn into macrophages. And the macrophages are the ones that are out here in the interstitial fluid. Okay. And now we see parts of uh, the connective tissue that is outside of the blood vessel. Fibroblasts, elastin, these are all proteins. Uh, proteoglycan filaments, and then especially this one, this is really important, collagen. Okay, So we can say right now that if the blood senses that there's collagen, so if you have a mixing of collagen or any of these other fibers with the blood, automatically right then you know that there's been damage because these guys here should not be interacting with the blood okay that shouldn't take place okay and I say that because that's a trigger when when uh, when collagen is exposed that's a trigger for an inflammatory response because you know that damage has taken place okay all right so acute inflammatory response the early what that is acute that means it comes on very quickly. Inflammatory response. The early or immediate local, so we like to keep it local at first, reaction to injury, and it's associated, associated with the innate immune system as opposed to the adaptive or acquired immune system, uh, which is where your lymphocytes get involved. So the innate immune system is pretty nonspecific. It's just sort of always there. Anything that looks a little foreign to, to your innate immune cells, which are the leukocytes, um, not including the lymphocytes that we've talked about. Those are, those are all part of the innate immune system, the, 
the neutrophils, the basophils, the macrophages, those are all innate immune system white blood cells. Okay, so um, they're designed to remove injurious agents and limit tissue damage. Okay, so that's what that's what we want. That's those are the good things about inflammation is that they they do this. They get rid of anything in there that's kind of making a mess uh, or causing some kind of damage. They get rid of those things, and uh, and then so you can start healing again. Okay, so it's triggered by infections, uh, immune response or immune reactions. So you get something in you, inhale something, hay fever, whatever, and you activate mast cells. The little little antibodies that have been stuck into mast cells will suddenly activate those mast cells. They'll release histamine, binds to histamine receptors, and you have a little bit of inflammation in that area. Um, in, in, in the case of asthma, it could actually trigger an asthma attack. You could have the release of leukotrienes. Okay, so physical or chemical uh, trauma. So that means you get cut or scratched or something like that. Okay. Uh, cardinal signs of inflammation. So this is what we look for to see if there's inflammation. Ruber, tumor, calor, duller, uh, functia laser. Ruber, redness, tumor, swelling, calor, heat, and duller, pain, and functia laser, uh, loss of function. I ran out of I ran out of ideas for, for interesting fonts with that one, so I sort of lost my function of making fonts. I don't know, whatever. Uh, but these have been around from the first or second century AD. Remember these, that's just sort of something you, you need to know. They all make sense. Redness, redness because you have increased blood flow usually, swelling because you have more fluid flowing out of the capillaries into the interstitial fluid, uh, calor, calor, heat, um, a lot of times that's because of increased blood flow as well, pain, pain is, is the release of certain prostaglandins and other molecules that cause pain, it, it actually triggers pain, it says, hey, we've been damaged here, tell the brain, and that message goes to the brain as pain, uh, and then loss of function, so anytime you're damaging cells, um, you're going to lose function. Okay, so your book, like I said, breaks this up into two categories, two stages, vascular and cellular. So we're going to go through vascular first, and then we're going to talk about uh, the cellular phase. So vascular re is referring to the blood vessels. So, so that makes sense. Quick period. So, okay, so if you get an injury, an infection, if you, if you get something, something that triggers the inflammatory response, one of the first things that happened, happens is that you have vasoconstriction very, very quickly. Okay? So this arterial here will constrict, change colors there, it will constrict and which will slow or stop can actually completely stop blood flow to this area. Now that's good if you're bleeding out or something like that, and that may be maintained. But if it's just a localized inflammatory response, then uh, then what happens is immediately after that it says, oh, wait a minute, okay, there's been cell damage, and we actually need to let blood flow through. Okay, So we need to allow neutrophils, macrophages, other other factors uh, to move into the blood. So it dilates it. So, so you have vasoconstriction quickly followed by vasodilation. So now this dilates, which is going to actually slow the blood down. It's like, you know, if you're, if you're whitewater rafting and then it spreads into a big wide river, it slows down. Well, that's good because you've got the neutrophils in here that then are going to slow down a little bit and then they can move out. So neutrophils may move out, proteins may move out, uh, fluid moves out, we call this exudate. So anything that's moving out into the, ex, uh, the extracellular fluid uh, is that's going to happen first in the vascular phase. Okay, so increased blood flow leads to net flow of fluid and plasma proteins out of the vessel into the tissue. Because remember, we have blood flowing in, and then we have this sort of hydrostatic pressure, this pressure that's pushing fluid out of the vessels. And this is, in this case, we're talking about capillaries. But we also have colloidal osmotic pressure from all of the particles in here that's pulling fluid back in. And so we have this going 
most of the time this is more or less matching each other uh, the rest of it will then leave through the lymph and so that's what's normally going on but then when we have vasodilation this increases the blood flow which is going to increase the hydrostatic pressure and now you're going to be pushing more fluid out and fluid is not going to be moving back in as as quickly as it was okay so this kind of decreases and this very much increases and so you have more of this exudate more of these proteins that are being pushed out more of this fluid that's being pushed out okay all right so that's the that's the vessel stage and that's initially going to be this moving of this exudate moving of this fluid out into the extracellular tissue but it doesn't really stop there uh, damaged tissues and resident immune cells like macrophages and mast cells, those guys, remember, they were kind of hanging out out here. So they were already out. So I could draw here a mast cell that was just sort of sitting there when all of a sudden, you know, uh, uh, I don't know, whatever we've been damaged with, a, a splinter or something came in. Okay, it caused cell damage, and this guy, who was just sort of sitting there waiting for trouble, sends a signal and says, hey, it releases cytokines, it releases histamine, but it releases these signaling molecules that say, hey, we've got a little problem down here. Okay, so it'll activate what goes on inside the vessel, and um, so that's it. Damaged tissue and resident immune cells, macrophages, mast cells, release chemical signals, which are called cytokines, indicating that damage has occurred. So he's just sort of told uh, this local area that damage has occurred. Gaps form further increasing vessel permeability. So these endothelial cells usually are fairly close together. Okay, So there is some movement of fluid between. But what happens during inflammation is that these guys will actually shrink. So it may be, go from being this big to now these guys are only like this big. Okay. And so they leave gaps. And from those gaps, you can have, remember the rolling neutrophils? The neutrophils that were going along? Well, there are certain integrins, certain adhesion molecules that pop up. Okay, so here are these adhesion molecules not doing anything to begin with, and then when there's an inflammatory response, when this mast cell releases a signal, so that's one way that it happens. It could just be the presence of collagen that, that has signaled something has taken place. Um, but all of a sudden, these guys, these little uh, integrins, these little adhesion molecules will pop up, and they'll start grabbing these neutrophils and slowing them down. And then the neutrophils will, what's called transmigration, and move out into the extracellular fluid. So you can see the same thing here. You see the neutrophil that's just kind of going along, minding its own business, just strolling. And then all of a sudden, it is sucked to the side, which is called marginization. And then it moves through these gaps that have been formed and it moves out. Now, how does it know where to go? How does it know where the damage is? Well, that's a process called chemotaxis. Okay? So it's moved out of the vessel and now it's just sort of out there in the extracellular fluid and it's getting directions. There are molecules called chemokines that are being released by um, other cells, other inflammatory cells that may have already gotten there that could be released by uh, the resident inflammatory cells, white blood cells, um, and, and they release this trail of molecules called chemokines, and that's called chemotaxis. Taxis means to move, and so it moves in the direction of these chemokines, which is where the damage is, and in this particular picture, we can see a little bacteria sitting here. Um, that the neutrophil is drawn to and then it will it will try to take that out okay all right so neutrophils migrate towards those signals and then they phagocytose any invaders okay anything that doesn't match what they think a cell is supposed to or a, a body is supposed to have in it okay so eventually more macrophages are then pulled down remember the monocytes that are flowing through once those signals, once those cytokine signals and inflammatory markers start showing up, then any macrophages that come through here will also be drawn into the extracellular fluid, and they will also um, 
eat phagocytose uh, any bacteria, but they'll also phagocytose just damaged cells because obviously there's been some kind of cell damage that's taken place. Okay, so here's a nice here's a nice picture of that. Uh, you can see here uh, this is the neutrophil that's sort of moving through the the capillary, and then you have cytokine signaling from the in this case it's showing it coming from the mast cell. The macrophage there is is producing chemokines. And so this neutrophil moves down in the direction of the chemokines and then finds, of course, there's a wound here. And of course, pretty much any time you get a wound, you have bacteria uh, that's involved and, uh, and those things all come together and you start, you start to have that. So not only are you getting inflammation in terms of swelling, because swelling is taking place due to this increased permeability, so the fluid moving out. Um, but so not only are you getting that, but you also have now this activation of these white blood cells that are starting to try to clean things up. OK. All right. So inflammatory mediators, what chemicals are responsible? Now, this is when we think about what's going on so I'm gonna go I'm gonna go back to this picture because I didn't point something else out and that is blood platelets okay so so another thing that's gonna happen is if you have a wound you have you have some bleeding that's taking place um, you have these these bacteria so the bacteria that have invaded you have probably some bleeding that's taken place so let's just look at this and say okay what do we have to deal with here we have to deal with some kind of bleeding uh, tissue damage and um, and then we have bacteria. So there are certain things that the cell takes care of itself, okay? But let's look at what the liver is producing all the time. So in addition to, so if I draw a little blood vessel here, so in addition to these white blood cells that are going around, you have a bunch of, I'll make them green, you have a bunch of molecules that the liver's kind of pumping out all the time and they're always in there they're always in your bloodstream all they have to do is be activated okay and we call these plasma derived mediators the liver makes them but they're just circulating through your blood so then when there's damage these guys in the same way now these are not cells but they're molecules chemicals will move out some are proteins uh, most are proteins they'll move out and then they can be activated too. So acute phase proteins can cause fever and inflammation. Um, there are the factor, factor 12, Hegeman factor, we don't have to know that. But what this is talking about is the triggering of blood clotting, okay? Or forming a platelet plug or something like that. So, so blood clotting has to take place. And there are molecules that are floating around in your blood right now all they have to do is be activated and they will cause clots. That's good because clotting is something that has to take place fairly quickly if you get cut. You don't want to waste a lot of time and keep bleeding and bleeding and bleeding and wait for the liver to make some molecules to stop the bleeding. Uh, you want that to happen quickly. Okay, and then complement proteins. Now, um, complement protein is something that hopefully came up in your physiology class, but essentially complement proteins are a bunch of proteins that come together and make holes in bacteria and kill the bacteria that way. Okay, so we've already talked about cell, some of these cell-derived mediators. Um, um, preformed, so these guys, these are the things that are already, already there. Um, um, histamine, serotonin. Uh, we haven't talked about these lysosomal enzymes, uh, but those are things that, that are breaking down. Uh, in this case, these are reactive oxygen species that are trying to, to kill whatever's out there. Histamine and serotonin are activating the inflammatory response. Those things are happening, and those are localized. They come from the cell. Um, other things that are newly synthesized, so prostaglandins, leukotrienes, nitric oxide, those, those are all things that are, when the inflammation takes place, these guys are released. They're made and they, they're released at the time, okay? Um, not too worried about that. What, we, what you really need to know are the things that I'm, that I'm about to talk about here, okay? So these, so I'm going to separate these. Plasma-derived inflammatory mark mediators, remember I said that they're produced in the liver, uh, kinins are a group of those. The best example is bradykinin. 
uh, and it causes vasodilation. So the kinins are just a group of molecules that's made uh, and they tend to cause uh, vasodilation. Bradykinin also is responsible for triggering the pain response. Uh, basically, just it's just a response, goes to your neurons, uh, nothing special, but it tells your neurons to register it to the brain as being pain. Okay, uh, so it activates pain pain receptors. All right, coagulation and fibrinolysis proteins. Okay, so remember, something has just happened. Some kind of cell damage has happened. Chances are there's a there's a cut. There's some kind of bleeding, some kind of capillaries, some maybe some kind of exposure of blood to the surface of the skin. We want that bleeding to stop. Okay, so we have floating around. Um, a number of different proteins. I put a couple of examples here. There's a, there is a lot to clotting. Okay, there are a lot of steps to clotting. But I put a couple of things here. Prothrombin, fibrinogen are a couple of proteins that when they're activated, they lead to formation okay, of something called a fibrin mesh. Okay, So fibrinogen turns into fibrin and fibrin is a protein that creates a fibrin mesh, which is what you see here. Okay, so that and it traps platelets and blood vessel or blood cells, all that stuff together, and it basically stops bleeding. Bleeding. Okay, that's supposed to be bleeding. Okay, so it stops bleeding. So what do you need to know? Um, for this, you need to know that fibrin is a fibrous molecule that forms a fibrin mesh which traps platelets, blood vessel, blood cells, and, uh, and stops the bleeding. Okay, so that's the first part of the pl clotting process is you stop the bleeding. Okay, uh, and then the complement system. The complement system, circulating molecules, so I have a picture of these. There are Oh, I don't remember how many, about 12 or 15 complement proteins, all different. They come together. Basically, what you need to know is that they create pores in invaders. So you can see that here. All these little holes were made by complement proteins coming together, inserting themselves into the membrane, poking holes in it, and that guy isn't going to be able to survive. He's going to fill up with water. He's going to leak his insides, and the outsides are going to move in. Okay. So those were things that were created and in the liver and then excreted, and they're in your blood system right now, just waiting to be activated. Cell-derived inflammatory mediators, there are a bunch of those too. Histamine and serotonin. So we've talked about that. Serotonin actually was named from sero, which means serum. It was first found in blood. We know it mainly as a neurotransmitter, but it was first found in blood, blood platelets. Okay, uh, histamine is a, it's an amino acid molecule. Uh, there are receptors for it, and that will then go on to cause an inflammatory response in, in and of itself, okay? Uh, so you have histamine receptors, that's why you take antihistamines, and then that blocks that inflammatory response that's caused by, by histamine, okay? So both of these are inflammatory triggers. It really just depends on the source. Mast cells are very well known for releasing histamine and creating a histamine response. Okay, so inflammatory triggers released by granulocytes and in the case of serotonin released by platelets uh, and they tend to cause dilation of the arterioles. So when you have a histamine response and usually we think of things like poison ivy or, or like a mosquito bite even, uh, that what you what you see is it becomes red. It becomes red and a little bit, well, I guess, inflamed. Um, and that's because of the dilation of the arterial. So you've increased blood flow to that area, which means that you're going to have some kind of exudate. You're going to have some kind of fluid flowing into the uh, extracellular fluid, okay? Uh, and increased permeability of the venules. So more fluid moving through. Now, these, I'm going to talk about these specifically, prostaglandins, leukotrienes, omega-3s. Um, cytokines, chemokines, and then a little bit about nitric oxide and reactive oxygen species again. So we're, remember, we're still talking about inflammatory mediators that come from cells, cell-derived inflammatory mediators. For the most part, um, 
when we think about things like prostaglandins, maybe you've heard the term prostaglandins, maybe you haven't. Uh, less of a chance probably you've heard the term leukotrienes. But these guys are critical in a more, let's see, so you have release of histamine, has, the release of histamine happens quickly, and sometimes the inflammatory response will kind of kind of peter out with the release of histamine and, and uh, a little bit of vasodilation, maybe some itching. Um, it takes a little bit longer for these inflammatory responses to happen because uh, they're called eicosanoids. I'm not too worried about you remembering that. It means 20 um, because there are 20 carbons on it. These, the prostaglandins and the leukotrienes are made from cell membranes. So here's your, here are your phospholipids that make up your cell membrane. Now, if you could sort of imagine taking one tail of this phospholipid, okay, straightening it out, and then bending it over. Okay, so bend it, bending it in half. So there, there it is to start with, and then you bend it like a hairpin. What you end up with is something called arachidonic acid. Okay, so remember, this all started from the membrane of the cells in the area. Okay, all you've done is you've released a, an enzyme that will cut this off, it'll cut one of these guys off, and then it bends it around to make something called arachidonic acid. Well, then that arachidonic acid, there's something called cyclooxygenase that turns that arachidonic acid into a prostaglandin. Okay? It's not that difficult, really, when you think about it. Here are your phospholipids. They're everywhere. They're around every single cell. You cut one off. You twist it around. You make something called arachidonic acid. And then from that arachidonic acid, another enzyme creates something called a prostaglandin. This is what prostaglandins do. Inflammation, vasodilation, clotting, they can cause fever, okay, so, so they do, they, they lead to all of these stuff, all of these things. Inflammation, vasodilation is mainly their local response, but now if you get into uh, the hypothalamus, they can actually trigger fever. Uh, pain is another one that I didn't put here. Pain is also caused by prostaglandins. The reason this is so important to understand is because this conversion from this molecule to a prostaglandin is done by this enzyme cyclooxygenase. That is what aspirin and NSAIDs like ibuprofen block. So they block cyclooxygenase, they're COX inhibitors, COX. Um, there's COX-1, COX-2, that's, that's not that important. But they block this cyclooxygenase, or this COX, and, they, and then you don't have the prostaglandins, which means you've reduced inflammation, you've reduced this vasodilation, uh, and systemically you've reduced fever and you reduced pain, and that's exactly what these guys are. Okay, Aspirin and NSAIDs are pain and fever and inflammatory reducers okay so that should hopefully that makes sense now over here we have leukotrienes and the reason that leukotrienes are important and, and an important thing to know is because they they work similar to histamine they cause um, they cause inflammation vasodilation but they also cause smooth muscle contraction and they especially cause smooth muscle contraction in your respiratory airways okay in your respiratory tracts. Okay, so do we see why that's significant? This is just something they figured out in the past, I don't know, 10 years or so. So that means that what we see is that we see leukotrienes being activated in asthma. Okay. So what we want to do then is if we could prevent leukotrienes from being made then we can minimize asthma. And so that's why a lot of asthma medications have something called corticosterones or steroid-based because steroids block these phospholipids from ever being cut off and twisted around to make the arachidonic acid. Okay, so this process of making that arachidonic acid never takes place. And so your leukotrienes and your prostaglandins are never made. Okay. And you can also see your prostacyclin thromboxane, which is involved in clotting. That's also why aspirin uh, 
they say it thins your blood. Well, it, it does. It reduces some of your um, some of the clotting factors in your blood. So it, in a way, I mean, that's kind of a crude way of saying it, but in a way it does. It's going to reduce uh, clotting. So, so that's why all of these things work. And uh, so I think you're going to need this again. Uh, it should come up when you take, uh, um, uh, what is it, pharmacology. But right now it's important to know it because they are involved in the inflammatory response. All right. So more cell-derived inflammatory mediator, cytokines. Now, I've been talking about cytokines as being signaling molecules. Well, now I want to get a little more specific, uh, and I want to talk about two of them, two of them that come up all the time. This one is tumor necrosis alpha, and this is interleukin-1. Okay? Um, tumor necrosis alpha, TNF alpha, IL-1, interleukin-1. And these are released from cells. And what they tend to do is activate all of these responses, okay? So, so when, so here's a macrophage that said, whoa, you know, there's, there's something going on. I see lipopolysaccharides. Um, and so, or it's activated by T cells, or it, it matches up with something on a T cell. It will release these cytokines, TNF-alpha and IL-1, which is going to activate all of these things, endothelial cells, adhesion molecules, cytoadhesion molecules, remember to pull the, to pull the neutrophils down, uh, more cytokines, eicosanoids, which are the prostaglandins, leukotrienes, uh, chemokines for chemotaxis, uh, oxygen radicals, and all, all of these things, aggregation of neutrophils, fever, anorexia, loss of appetite, uh, hypotension, increased heart rate, all of all of these guys are triggered by the release of TNF-alpha and interleukin-1. So you're going to probably see that again if you haven't seen it already, just these guys. There are over 30 known cytokines. The reason I'm making a big deal about this is because I learned about cytokines uh, from an immunology class and it was overwhelming. And it wasn't until years later that I said, you know what, the only ones anybody ever talks about are these two. Okay. And that's true. And I mean, it comes up a lot. There are a lot of different cytokines that do a lot of different things, but the ones that are really, truly involved in uh, stimulating the inflammatory response are TNF-alpha and IL-2. And those are most, that's most of what I read about. Okay, so uh, chemokines, not to be confused with cytokines, chemokines are related to chemotaxis. So that's a different group of molecule. And, uh, and they are the ones that are set, kind of putting down the breadcrumbs saying, hey, this is where the damage is over here. Follow me this way. Okay, and so if you are a neutrophil, you can say, all right, well, it looks like really things are going down over here. And then you can move down there and nom, 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 start eating the bacteria. Okay, um, now a couple of others just to sort of be familiar with. Nitric oxide, nitric oxide is a potent vasodilator. Okay, it is one of the most potent vasodilators ever found. Uh, nitroglycerin uh, directly leads to the production of nitric oxide, uh, which is why people uh, have that for, you know, people who are at risk for a heart attack, they can take their nitroglycerin, it causes vasodilation and opens up their blood vessels. Okay, reactive oxygen species. Well, you know, when you have a lot of react reactive oxygen species, that's usually not a good sign, and that a lot of times signifies that there has been some kind of cell damage. So these guys can actually trigger more cytokine release, um, but if they get to a higher concentration, they can actually damage surrounding cells, which is not not so good. Okay. All right. So I've been talking about exudate. Uh, things that are moving out, exudate is the fluid and other substances that move into the extracellular matrix. Um, so what this is, basically it's an indication of the site and severity of the inflammation. And uh, so serious, though, so that would be something that you would find like in a blister. Uh, it's watery, clear, it doesn't have very much protein. It's, uh, it, it means that the damage is probably not very bad. And then on the other side of the spectrum, you have hemorrhagic. That's severe tissue issue. To, to severe tissue injury with damage to blood vessels. So that's when you've got blood in your extracellular fluid. And then there are various, various um, uh, uh, sort of, I guess, 
things that fall in between. So fibrinous, uh, so you've got fibrin, fibrin are proteins that can move out. Okay, so you may not have entire cells that are moving out, you may not have blood cells that are moving out, but you do start to have a buildup of fibrin, and you can see this uh, in certain areas when you're, when you're, well, if you were to surgically take things out and you were to look at it, you could say, okay, well, there's some fibrous tissue. This is something that's found in the heart with heart damage. Uh, you may have enough cell damage or enough inflammatory of an inflammatory response that you start seeing fibrin and fibrous molecules kind of collecting in the extracellular uh, matrix there. Uh, membranous develop on mucous membranes. Uh, and these guys, uh, they actually have necrotic cells, cells that are cells that are dying, okay, that are that are also collected in the exudate, uh, fibropurulent exudate. Uh, so you'll see some fibrous uh, materials too, um, and uh, a bit a bit of uh, of pussy kind of kind of look, but but not nearly as much, okay? So, and they tend to, to they tend to uh, focus on the uh, mucous membranes. Purulent suppurative, degraded white blood cells, okay? So when we were talking, remember we were talking about neutrophils and we were talking about pus, okay? Uh, so degraded white blood cells, proteins, tissue debris. debris. Uh, usually when you see this level of, um, of pus building up, then that is indicative of a bacterial infection, okay? May form an abscess, fibrous proteins may wall off the area requiring an incision to drain, okay? So that's, that's a little bit more, more serious. You're trying to launch a white blood cell uh, defense, which means that there's probably bacteria hiding in it, and uh, that's sort of what that, what that exudate indicates. All right. Um, all right, so that was trying to keep it local. Now we say, oh, we give up on local. Local, you know, worked for a little while, it was looking good, but then uh, we kind of lost control. So if localized control is not, it's not possible, then it becomes systemic or body-wide, okay? And that's when you have proteins uh, that are being released into the, uh, into circulation. So acute phase proteins, that's usually, those are usually released fairly quickly within hours to days um, when the localized response doesn't, doesn't happen right. Then you'll have cytokines that are released into, uh, that, that go systemic and you have enough of them that are released that they're, they kind of go all over the body. And there's that tumor necrosis alpha and the IL-1. Uh, C-reactive protein is another one. I'm not too worried about that one right now. But these guys, when they're released, they get the attention of the liver, and the liver says, "Oh, well, gosh, it looks like you know you weren't able to handle this locally, uh, and so I'm going to start producing as the liver more inflammatory proteins, more of these soluble inflammatory proteins. So higher fibrinogen levels cause red blood cells to accumulate." Okay, because remember, fibrinogen is one of those things that the liver is making for clotting to make this fibrin mesh. Fibrin mesh. Okay, uh, and we can see that in the lab is increased sedimentation rate. So we've got more um, we've got more fibrinogen. So that means that when you put blood out, then it will it will clot more quickly. Uh, or sediment more quickly. All right, what white blood cell response, stimulation of white blood cell uh, production, leukocytosis. So you now you start making more of the neutrophils. And the neutrophils were there. We have a lot of them, but for whatever reason, we didn't have enough. And so what you see now, you can see, I'm going to draw this in a kind of a simplistic way. What you see, if you look at your blood right now, you will see some immature neutrophils and some medium mature neutrophils and then some older neutrophils okay probably more more than that they're probably um, and they're not necessarily it's not necessarily based on size but this is kind of clear so so what we see with a systemic manifestation is is all of a sudden we have the triggering of making more okay so if this is what we normally see we just see sort of an even distribution well after, if you're looking at labs and you say, gosh, are we having a systemic response? Are, are more neutrophils being made? And you look at the labs, then what you're going to see is you're going to see way more of immature 
neutrophils, and that's what we call a left shift. So uh, where it was just pretty even, now you have this left shift and you see a lot more immature neutrophils, which means, okay, the body has just gotten a signal saying, hey, whatever's going on, we can't, we can't handle it with what we already have, so we got to make more neutrophils, okay? Uh, that's what this left shift means. Uh, macrophage may activate lymphocytes. So now we have um, B cells, T cells that are being activated. Uh, so that's another white blood cell response. So we have the left shift. We have more B cells and T cells. Um, systemic inflammatory response, overwhelming release of cytokines. Okay, So sometimes that can be very, very bad. Uh, if you have bacterial infections in the blood, uh, then you have you you can get sepsis, which is um, which is just that it's an infection that has that has moved into the blood, and your body has a system wide inflammatory response, and that can actually be uh, deadly. Okay, so um, so acute phase proteins, these guys first being made, white blood cell response, so neutrophil macrophages. Uh, lymphocyte or lymph macrophage activation of lymphocytes, and then the overwhelming release of cytokines. All right. Let's see. Oops. 19. All right. So now that was systemic. Now we have chronic inflammation. So we've tried. We did all we could. We did our we did our local response, and then there that turned into a systemic response. And for whatever reason, whatever we're trying to get rid of isn't going away. So that could be inflammation lasting two weeks or longer. That's chronic inflammation. So what causes that? An unsuccessful acute inflammatory response is one cause of it low-grade persistent infections or irritants so something has gotten stuck in there and you're and you you can't get you can't get rid of it uh, obesity so adipocytes have been shown to increase there's that there's that cytokine again TNF alpha okay so so they they uh, constantly release TNF alpha which causes kind of this low level of inflammation so what can happen um, well, when you have constant here healing, you know, you're constantly trying to send signals, growth signals saying, OK, we need to heal this. We need to heal this. Too many growth signals uh, might be able to might lead to cancer formation. Uh, the DNA damage of it trying to uh, repair itself, this constant division uh, can ultimately maybe lead to DNA damage, um, which leads to cancer or can lead to cancer I shouldn't say it always does usually it leads to cell death but if you have a bad mutation you may end up with cancer um, granulomatous formation so granulomas form when macrophages are unable to fully clear an invader okay so we hear a lot about this with tuberculosis um, but it happens all the time I mean uh, I think there are I was I was looking at some research and there are a number of people a pretty high percentage of people that have granulomas uh, in their lungs, some people who've never smoked, never done anything, they might form a granuloma. You might inhale something that gets caught in there, and then the macrophages work on it for a little while, and then finally they say, we can't do it. So they wall it off, and they just isolate it, okay? And that's a granuloma, okay? All right, so another thing that happens with chronic inflammation, uh, you don't have the localized edema, okay? that you had before, you don't have the no neutrophil inf infiltration. So that would be bad. The neutrophils live for a little while and then they and then they go away. You have a different kind of response for chronic inflammation. And that's where the neutrophils are allowed to die, the macrophages and lymphocytes. Remember, lymphocytes, T cells, might primarily in this case, um, accumulate in the damaged area and they keep releasing inflammatory mediators. It's asymptomatic. You may not notice it at first, but it causes tissue damage over time. Okay, so you're constantly trying to to fix fix whatever's wrong, and ultimately what you're doing is you're actually um, you're actually causing some damage. And and this picture uh, down here, um, well, we'll get to that. So that may that the constant. 
trying to repair constant tri the attempts at proliferation uh, may damage the DNA. That can also result in cer certain cancers, cervical, liver, stomach. And a lot of these things, honestly, even if we don't know exactly how they work, we see it. We see that with chronic inflammation, we see an uptick in cancer. And so we may not know all of the processes involved every step of the way, but we definitely know that uh, there is an increase in these particular types of cancer. Uh, granul granulomatous inflammation, this is actually kind of important. Uh, macrophages mass together around foreign bodies. So in this case, you can see this taking place in an artery. Okay, and you see here something called foam cells. Well, foam cells are when macrophages collect together and they kind of change um, and they, they don't exactly die, but they, but they collect together and they stop being functional and they form these things called foam cells. And in this case, you can kind of see where they formed here in the interstitial fluid, but they're pushing out. They're pushing out on this, on the, uh, the inner wall, the endothelial cells of this artery and you have other things. You have lipids that are that are forming in there. Uh, in this case, you have a thrombus. Thrombus meaning a clot because you have an inflammatory response. You have damage to the vessel, and so it's trying to fix it. But in this case, it's chronic and it's not able to fix it. So it just kind of keeps throwing things at it and keeps and keeps uh, making a low-level attempt to uh, to fix it and ultimately it's actually doing more harm than good uh, because it's because it's um, because it's pushing on the outer edge of this now a lot of times this is caused by I mean this may clear um, but a lot of times it's just caused by things like hypertension you you've got um, you have high blood pressure chronic high blood pressure then uh, that's going to cause you know localized little um, Dam localized damage to to vessels uh, just from the high blood pressure and uh, and then that can create this chain reaction type of inflammatory response um, where it can't really heal okay uh, so that's so that's bad uh, so macrophages may collect form foam cells and arteries leading to atherosclerosis all right so fever that's the other thing um, that we haven't talked about yet fever we don't really know why we get fever Okay, hands down, we don't really know why. There are a lot of guesses. There are a lot of very good guesses. There are a lot of guesses that are probably correct, um, but it's not absolutely known. We can't point at anything and say, yep, this is why you get fever. We can assume that there's some use, um, but we don't necessarily know it. Okay, I think I've said that enough. So certain proteins have different activation at different temperatures. So if you think about that, then there are certain things called heat shock proteins, uh, we'll call them HSPs, heat shock proteins that are turned on at, at different temperatures. Um, there are also stress proteins. And so we know that certain things happened and that, and that even when it comes to bacteria, viruses, things like that, that their proteins are going to want to grow at a certain temperature. So maybe changing the temperature will slow their growth. So it'll, it'll interfere with their their growth, which which would be which would be helpful for fighting off diseases, um, but ultimately this is what really matters. Um, this is where it's this is where I guess the rubber hits the road kind of mentality. A fever indicates that there's a disease state and possible need for medical treatment. This we know. This we absolutely know to be true. A fever is not good. It means that you have uh, most likely an infection, some kind of a disease state. So manifestation, anorexia, fatigue, malaise, and if you look at all of these things, uh, yeah, you probably shouldn't eat when you have a fever. Uh, you don't feel like eating. If you've lost your appetite, that could actually be good because not eating and resting conserves energy. If you have, you know, a giant steak dinner while you have a fever, uh, even though, you know, your great grandma may have said, oh yeah, you should feed the fever, um, it's it's not it doesn't make sense from a uh, an energy 
uh, perspective because now you've got all these resources, all this energy going into digesting and dealing with and then putting away because that food that you're absorbing, you have to put it all in the right places. Now your body's going to be busy with that uh, when it might need that energy to fight off whatever invaders there are. That doesn't mean you should quit eating at all, uh, but it's just saying that this sort of anorexia or loss of appetite actually makes sense. Uh, chill from the body's attempts to warm itself. This is another interesting thing. Um, when I was little, I always thought that you felt chills when you had a fever. You felt cold when you had a fever uh, because your body was warmer, which made the outside air feel cold. Well, you know, that's not really, that's not really true. Uh, what it is, is that you feel a chill for the same reason that when you're cold, you feel a chill. Your body's, your body temperature is falling below your set point. When you're healthy, your set point is 37 degrees, 98.6. That's when you're healthy. Okay. So if your body temperature starts to below, fall below that, to 97, 96, something like that, uh, you know, certain parts, then you'll get a chill and you'll start to shiver and you'll want to find a blanket and you'll raise it. Well, what happens when you have a fever is your brain gives you a different set point. So now it's saying, you know what? Our new set point is now 101 degrees. Get there. How, whatever it takes, you need to start being at 101 degrees. Then your body responds and says, yeah, but I'm only at like 98.6. And you're asking me to go up, you know, two to three degrees higher. And it's like, yeah, that's what I'm asking you to do. So your body's, your body's response is the same thing as when you're out and it's freezing cold outside. You start to shiver. You start to look for a blanket. You try to warm your body because your brain is telling you that's your new temperature. And then when you get to that new temperature, the chills will go away. Well, I'm fine now. You know, well, you're not fine. You still feel like crap, but, but at least the chills will stop. You'll stop trying to warm yourself. All right. Um, so the chills trigger shivering when the body reaches the new set point, the chills stop. Causes, there are little molecules, a group of molecules called pyrogens. Uh, they're released from macrophages or endothelial cells, the endothelial cells being part of the, uh, the capillaries. Uh, some kind of a trigger says, hey, we're going to raise the temperature and you start to release these pyrogens. Um, when that happens, there are prostaglandins. This is why aspirin and NSAIDs work because they block the production of these prostaglandins. But these prostaglandins will form in the hypothalamus, which is a brain region, to change that set point. Okay, so that set point goes up, you get fevers or you get chills and you want to cover up until you get there. Okay, so fever mechanism. I think I've said a lot of this. Uh, cause the release of pyrogens, fever triggering molecules, that's what they are, may be released from host macrophages, pathogens, endotoxins from the pathogens will, will directly cause, uh, cause a fever or endothelial cells from the blood cells. Temperature control takes place in the hypothalamus, okay, and this sort of shows where the hypothalamus is here. It's uh, right around the thalamus and right above the pituitary. So the hypothalamus is sitting here and the max is really about 41 degrees or 105 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's really the max temperature that your hypothalamus will let you go to. Um, it's kind of a built-in set point uh, because it doesn't want to kill you, uh, but for some reason it wants to give you a fever, wants to increase your temperature. Um, so any of these things, the release of cytokines, endotoxins, endotoxins which are from bacteria, okay, uh, certain gram-negative bacteria specifically. Uh, endotoxins triggers prostaglandin release in the hypothalamus to form a new set point. Physiological mechanisms, this is what I was explaining earlier, uh, and behavior. Physiological meaning metabolism means means your, your cells start working a little faster. Anything to increase heat. Uh, behavioral shivering, covering up, all of those things. As soon as that temperature set point is changed, then you start to get the chills and you'll warm up responses until the new set point is achieved. Uh, and this here, maybe we know this intuitively, but neurological damage can alter the body's ability to maintain a constant temperature. So some people actually aren't able to maintain a temperature if they've had you know, any kind of damage that affects the, uh, the hypothalamus. Okay, so this is something I'm not too worried about. Fevers may be expressed differently depending on the cause. Um, 
we're not too concerned about that because we're we're not talking about the reasons for it but you can have an inter intermittent fever bacterial sepsis abscesses things like that which means that the fever kind of comes and goes uh, these are days one day two day three day four day so it goes up half the day down half the day um, a sustained fever may be drug induced so that means that the fever is just kind of high all the time and then um, high all the time drug induced uh, and able to meet a set point, so we have um, this is a remittent fever, which means that you're trying to it's it's not really stabilizing on anything. It's just kind of kind of going up and down, but it's not the wild, you know, going back to normal then high, normal high. This is kind of high the whole time. It's 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 elevated the whole time, but it's not sustained like we saw here. And then a relapsing fever. This may happen. It may go away. So your body may uh, fight off whatever it is or neutralize whatever it is for a little while. And then whatever that infectious disease is makes a comeback. And then your fever goes back up again. Okay. So the last thing. Um, Think. Yeah, fever in pediatrics. Now, the thing to remember with fever in pediatrics is the severity of the fever does not indicate the severity of the illness in the child. Okay, so so the uh, the set point of a child can alter, can change wildly, and uh, just because a child doesn't have a very big fever might not mean that they're not very sick, or because they have a very high fever, it might not mean that they're very very sick. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure if I said that correctly. But it doesn't necessarily how, uh, indicate how sick they are. Fever in geriatrics, due to a disturbance in the functioning of this thermoregulatory center, the elderly can have slight elevations with severe illness and no fever or low body temperature with an infection. So, infection. So, kind of the same thing, except in the elderly, their thermoregulatory center, uh, the hypothalamus, uh, is not necessarily functioning properly. Okay, and that's it for this section.